A shocking crime rocks suburban Miami. They knew that she was missing, and they were hoping for the best. But the crime scene holds little evidence. We're getting frustrated. We were getting nowhere. Until detectives get a break from an unusual source. I was determined to find this monster. These are the true stories of real cases and the psychics who help investigators solve their most baffling mysteries. Suburban Miami, a warm, breezy night. Inside the home of well-known local attorney, Herb Abramson, he and his wife, Barbara, are suddenly roused from their sleep. Originally, Mrs. Abramson thought it was her young son who had awakened. And then she heard the words, shut up or I'll kill you. Took the jewelry off their body, went around the room, found the jewelry box, took the additional jewelry. Not a word. And then tied them up with uh, some sort of electrical wire that was already in the bedroom. The Abramsons eventually free themselves and rush to check on their children. The first bedroom they came to was their teenage son, Scott. He was asleep. But their 18-year-old daughter, Erin, home from college, is missing. And that's when they call 911. Our daughter is missing. Police rush to the Abramsons' home. The rooms have been ransacked, and there was what appeared to be a blood stain on Erin's bed. They also discover that the Abramsons' Mercedes is gone. It looks like a kidnapping. But hours pass without any ransom demands. Police open a missing persons investigation. We, of course, asked the Abramson family what types of boyfriends or friends did she have. Mrs. Abramson advised us of a Mr. DeVito. But Mike DeVito says he has no idea what happened to Aaron. You don't have any alibi as to where you were and what time you got home. I have nothing to hide here. That's he stated that he would take a polygraph examination if requested of it. Uh, after speaking to Mike DeVito for a while, he was convincing us that he was not involved. Police put out an APB on the stolen car and publicized the missing jewelry, but nothing turns up. Then, investigators make a grim discovery. Police confirm what the family had the body found near the trash station was that of the missing college student. She had been wrapped in what appeared to be blankets and possibly a yellow type of cloth. She had 14 stab wounds on her body puncture wounds to her front, back, and hands. It's as if she was trying to defend herself in the attack. There was some blood on the scene, but there was not sufficient blood to indicate that the incident would have occurred at that particular location. She was killed elsewhere and dropped there. The next day, police find the Abramson stolen Mercedes. The Abramson's vehicle was found approximately one mile north and east of where the body had been located. Close examination revealed what appeared to be bloodstains. And a bloodstained sock inside of this vehicle. Police canvassed the area. And that's going door to door. People in the area who just may have been walking by or awake or seen any unusual activity might have some information. But no one remembers anything out of the ordinary. From the public, we need uh, help and assistance from anyone who has any information. If we have a whodunit and very little information as to who it is, we do reach out for help. When conducting a homicide investigation, time is crucial. As time goes by, evidence and leads get colder. Detective Turner and I went to the Abramson home uh, once the crime scene had been processed to look through some of Aaron's more personal things. Teenagers are difficult to track because you know, they have a lot of friends. Uh, they don't confide in their parents about where they're going and what they do. While we were doing this, a woman arrived at the house who I didn't recognize. She's a neighbor from down the street, and she has some information. I could see him with her. It was a man. Have detectives found a witness to the crime? When we return. While investigating the abduction and murder of Aaron Abramson, Miami detectives meet a neighbor who claims to have seen the crime, but not as an eyewitness. 
Because when I heard the name Nikki Dane, I, re I remember her from television. I've heard her name several times. They call it an extra natural sense of perception. At least that's what I call it. It's a gift. Sometimes it's a curse. And in this one particular case, it was a nightmare. She had worked several other cases around the nation, helping different police agencies. I wasn't big on psychics because I didn't really understand it. But we had nothing, so we were, we were grabbing straws. Anything that would help solve this particular case is what we needed. Dane heads to Erin's room and looks through her belongings. Because she said she wanted to get some type of information that would lead us to a suspect or evidence in the crime. I remember looking real quickly through a notebook. Suddenly, Mickey has a vision. And I could see hearts and flowers. He told her he was coming over. She was excited. What walked in was not what she had pictured. She was terrified, and I could feel the terror. I could hear her screaming. Boyfriend. It is the boyfriend. She said that her feelings were that the person that killed her was involved with her. She thought that this this fellow was tops, that he was going to ride off in a white horse. And he carried her out in her father's Mercedes. Detectives have already ruled out Mike DeVito. She had other boys that had crushes on her. Somebody that was going to come over that night or see somebody, then she said no, that a, a guy was coming that she was very interested in. If Aaron had another boyfriend, no one knew about it. And there's no way to track him down. The trail grows cold. But not for Mickey. I see him washing his hands. He works with his hands in water. In water. But he isn't clean. Homicide, Detective Turner, may I help you? Rosie. She told us that she had a vision. I'm seeing the letters R S. R S. He lives somewhere where they stored a lot of water. Like a water storage facility. What do you think, Rosie? She's persistent. She says the guy's initials are R and S, and that he lives near a water tower or something. Coming in holds water, right? Detectives follow the psychic's lead. We went everywhere looking for water towers, uh, water treatment facilities, and we weren't able to find anything like that. And the initials R S don't ring a bell with any of Aaron's friends. So we just asked about R S, and we came up with nothing. Investigators are at a dead end until a local pawnbroker gives them an unexpected lead. He'd received some jewelry which matched the jewelry displayed on the public information broadcast that we had done about this case. Detective Turner and I headed right up to that pawn shop. This is it. It says Herb on it. says Herb right on it, yeah. He said that a white male had come there to sell him these items. The pawnbroker asked the man for ID. In order to keep the industry honest, uh, they're required to fill out all sorts of forms. Can I have a picture? But he only had ID without a photograph. So the pawnbroker refused to do business with him. Just a couple seconds later, he comes back in with a woman. You're identified as Holly Sanborn. According to the broker, she appeared to be a relative. Well, Holly Sanborn had to use a driver's license, and that was a, a very critical lead. We then got Mrs. Sanborn's address from the pawnbroker and went to her house. Mrs. Sanborn claims to know nothing about the jewelry until she finds out that it's part of a homicide investigation. And that's when she told us that, well, she got the jewelry from her son, Rusty. And Detective Turner and I kind of 
looked at each other and went, whoa, you know, Rusty Sanborn. That's the RS that Nikki talked about. If they can find an RS, they'll have him. Has the psychic led police to the killer? When we return. Detectives have traced the Abramson stolen jewelry to a man named Russell Sanborn. It's just as the psychic predicted. I'm seeing the letters R.S. Russell Sanborn, Rusty Sanborn, R.S. Investigators run a background check. Russell Sanborn's name surfaced as a local drug dealer in Air well who'd been in and out of prison. It was starting to look like a Rusty was a, a good suspect. But Rusty was nowhere to be found. Mrs. Sanborn had mentioned that he moved out of her house. And the last time she saw him was when she dropped him off somewhere on Hallandale Beach Boulevard to purchase a new car. And from that point, Detective Turner and I went to Hallandale Beach Boulevard, not knowing the name of the car firm where the car was purchased. For now, the suspect has eluded police. But he seems to be keeping an eye on his pursuers. And just out of the blue, Detective Turner receives a letter from Russell. Sir, left round my apartment with Aaron from 12 p.m. to 4 a.m. In it, Rusty claims his friend was the one who killed Aaron. He stated he and a friend by the name of Ronald Chica was at the residence with Aaron Abram from the night of the murder. He did it. He said that he had nothing to do with the homicide and that all he's guilty of is just selling the jewelry. I bought stolen property and that's all I did, Russell Sam. And that Ron Chica was the last person to be with Aaron while she was still alive. So he blamed it all on, on uh, this Ron Chica. Police know the name. He was known as someone who would sell uh, drugs in the local park. But Chica is also missing. We talked to several of his family members who weren't able to give us any information as to where he could be located. I was determined to find this monster. I see letters. Look for some handwritten letters. He's near water. I keep seeing the beach. Still getting the letters R S. He's a killer. I kept saying to Rosie, look for the letters, look for any papers, because I know there's there are letters that will incriminate him. I can see the crime. I can see the killer. I remember smoke. I saw him attacking her he stabbed her and then i saw him kill her go to the beach you'll you'll find out something while they're pouring over dane's latest clues police finally track down ron chica we found him in an ohio prison and that was what we considered a pretty tight alibi Detectives crank up their search effort for Rusty Sanborn. So the guy did everything right in here. And the hard work pays off. We went from car dealer to car dealer until we found where Rusty had bought the vehicle. After locating the car dealership, we were able to learn of an address in Miami where he was supposedly living. When the detectives arrive at Rusty's alleged residence, they're stunned by what they discover. We saw right across the street a car wash. And of course, my mind went, oh my God, you know, this is what Nikki said. She said something that contains water or a water plant of some kind. It was amazing. The little things that she was telling us was it's like falling into place. Confident they're on the right path, investigators take a closer look. It seemed as though it was 
not abandoned, but just not lived in. And we couldn't get anybody to come to the door. When we arrived, we observed some suspicious red stains on the doormat in front of a Sanborn's residence. We checked the area just around the door where we observed a white sock. This sock also had blood stains on it. It was a match to the sock that we had found in the Abrams vehicle earlier. We then recontacted the state attorney in an attempt to obtain a warrant to search the premises. Cases like this are complicated. You want to have a state attorney with you, or at least advising you, to be sure that your ducks are all in a row. I assisted Rosie in drafting the affidavit, and uh, we went before a judge, and the judge said, uh, go search. Armed with a search warrant, Detective Turner and I did make entry to Russell Sanborn's apartment. And the first impression I got from the apartment was that it just seemed too clean. My sixth sense just told me this was the place. This is where Aaron was murdered. I felt that the carpet looked especially suspicious. Got down on my hands and knees, and I began to rub the fibers of the carpet. And I came across an area that seemed stiff and sticky. We eventually cut the piece of carpet out and found blood stains on the padding under the carpet. And that's not all. We found a letter that uh, Russell Sanborn had written but had not mailed. I'm seeing the letters RS. He worked with his hands in water. Look for some handwritten letters. Now my mind is going back to Mickey and when she said keep your eye out or be on the lookout for letters. It's addressed to an ex-cellmate. Contained in the letter was the fact that he admitted or at least mentioned that he had ripped someone off. And it was talking about how he had met a beautiful young lady that was really nice and that her parents had a lot of money. Now convinced that Rusty Sanborn is their man, detectives begin a rigorous manhunt. Detective Turner and I discussed Mrs. Sanborn's involvement in this, and we were quite sure that she was protecting her son. We went to her house probably six to eight times a day asking for Russell. And I think that she must have felt the pressure because she finally said that, I think that you're going to find Russell on the beach. Obtaining that information, myself and Detective Zito then started to check every motel from Golden Gate south to South Beach. Finally, they spot Rusty's car at a beachside motel. We knocked on the door first, but no one came to the door. So our first thought was surveillance. And we got ourselves in a, into a hotel room and uh, just took turns with binoculars watching the place. The suspect finally shows. Rosie, it's him. It's Russell, man. Go, 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 guys. Go, he's there. Hey, there he is. <laughs> After Mr. Samuel was taken into custody, Detective Turner and I began our interview, and we got a little bit of about his background. And it turns out he's a plumber. And then we both kind of flash back that that's what Mickey said. You know, here's a man that works in or around water with his hands. The prosecution contends that Russell Sanborn befriended Aaron in order to gain access to her wealthy parents. He tied them up and took their jewelry. Terrified that she would identify him as the burglar, he brought her back to his apartment and killed her. Rusty Sanborn is convicted and sentenced to 133 years in prison. He got what we call a Buck Rogers sentence. He'll be out in the 25th century. Everything she told us was correct. I'm seeing the letters. From the initials to 
where the scene was, to his occupation, to the letters. It turned out to be true. The information that Mickey Dane gave us was, if not close, right on the button. Initially, I did not believe in psychics, but working with Miss Dame, I have found that they could be very helpful, and I would definitely work with a psychic again.